What's going on everyone? Charlie here. We're going to take another look at the regulation NMS and uh, the CT plan and pick off, pick up where we left off from last time. Basically, so far we've determined that the SEC has created modifications to this and against the SRO's wishes they have filed for comment on several provisions that they've changed and basically the filing structure outlines the different provisions, the comments received therein, and the SEC's ultimate decision uh, surrounding each individual section. So let's go ahead and uh, continue on and go ahead and look at the CT plan for regulation NMS. Okay, so we have term limits. So Article 4, Section 4.2b of the CT plan provides that non-SRO voting representatives are eligible to serve for two-year terms for a maximum of two terms total. That puts a four-year term or four-year consecutive uh, uh, year limit. So under this provision, after the expiration of a non-SRO voting representative's term, a replacement will be selected by a majority of the then-serving non-SRO representatives. Now this keeps conflict of interest at bay because the SROs, the self-regulatory organizations, wanted it to where they controlled all of the voting and all the representatives who basically represent them. So what the SEC has done They've came in and modified this to where non-SROs, that's the proposal, non-SROs will be selected by the then serving non-SROs, keeping conflicts of interest away and keeping for a fresh set of ideas as far as managing the plan. Now, the CT plan provides for a staggered start of the non-SRO voting representatives official terms, but provides that those non-SRO voting representatives whose official uh, terms would not begin until the third quarterly operating committee meeting after the effective date would temporarily serve as a non-SRO voting rep upon their selection and would still be eligible to be selected for another two year term. So now we get onto the comments uh, regarding this proposal. So several commenters expressed views on term limits proposed in Article 4, Section 4.2b. One commenter states that the maximum term limit imposed on non-SRO voting representatives in the CT plan could adversely affect the operations of the operating committee by barring members with more experience from serving on it and by making it more difficult to attract qualified candidates for all the categories of non-SRO voting representatives. Another commenter recommends allowing non-SRO voting reps to serve two-year terms and then take a break for two years before being eligible to serve again. Okay, so now we're getting into the comments that were proposed after the SEC proposed to have no more than two consecutive two-year term limits for the um, non-SRO voting representatives. So the commenter believes that this term structure will promote qualified participation by non-SROs while preserving an uh, egalitarian process which allows for rotation of representatives and provides any interested candidate the opportunity to serve. Another commenter recommends that non-SRO voting representatives be permitted to serve two-year consecutive terms or I'm sorry, serve two consecutive terms and then serve again after a one term break, arguing that there is a limited pool of individuals with adequate experience and knowledge that can serve and, and, that are, and that there are benefits from institutional knowledge gained from serving on the operating committee. In addition, one commenter believes that a non-SRO voting representative should be permitted to serve more than two terms, provided there is a sufficiently lengthy cooling off process. This commenter believes that the cooling off process should provide a check on any firms or individuals influence and would foster a sufficient deep pool of candidates. Several commenters recommended imposing term limits on SRO voting representatives. One commenter believes that by applying term limits to non-SRO voting reps, uh, the CT plan could advantage SROs relative to non-SROs with respect to relevant information and experience. Another commenter states that SRO voting reps should be subject to the same term limits as non-SRO voting reps. Another commenter similarly states that allowing SRO voting reps to serve indefinitely may be counterproductive. Okay, so now we get the SEC response to the comments received in regards to term limits. Now, it originally uh, proposed the um, no more than two consecutive two-year terms. It actually went ahead and based on the comments received, it is modifying it to the requirement that three years of non-service must follow every set of two three-year terms of service. So now instead of no more than two consecutive two-year terms, it's no more than two consecutive three-year terms. And the reason why they've done this change, again based on the comments, 
Commission finds that in order to preserve an appropriate balance between retaining institutional knowledge and allowing new perspectives to be heard, it is appropriate to require that after serving a defined amount of time, non-SRO voting reps should be required to observe a cooling off period before serving again, so as to allow others the opportunity to serve. In response to a commenter's claim that the SRO should have discretion to set non-SRO voting reps term limits, the Commission believes, as it stated in the governance order, ye dumbass, that the determination of term limits for non-SROs falls within its statutory authority under Section 11A of the Act, ye big bitch. In response to comments recommending that the terms of non-SRO voting reps be staggered by at least one or two years to ensure uh, continuity and consistency in representation, the Commission believes that the scheme for staggered terms proposed in the CT plan in combination with the Commission's modifications to the plan regarding term length and term limits for non-SRO voting reps, as discussed above, appropriately balances the goal of continuity of service among non-SRO voting reps with the goal of providing for rotation of non-SRO voting reps over time to help ensure a diversity of non-SRO viewpoints on the CT Plan Operating Committee. Finally, one commenter argues that the non-SRO voting reps should be empowered to participate in, in the governance of the current equity data plans as soon as those representatives are selected. While the Commission believes that adding the perspectives of non-voting SRO reps will be an important improvement to the governance structure for equity market data, the Commission does not believe that adding the non-SRO voting reps to the operating committee of the currently existing equity data plan can be accomplished in the context of approving the proposed CT plan or under the auspices of the I probably said that word wrong, I'm sorry, <laughs> of the governance order. The Commission agrees, however, that the input of non-SRO voting reps should be included in the governance of consolidated equity market data plan as soon as practicable. And the Commission has, as discussed above, sought to address this issue by adding deadlines to the CT plan for the achievement of the steps necessary for implementation. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the process for selecting non-SRO voting reps. The Commission is modifying this section to expressly permit advisory committee members to nominate themselves to serve as non-SRO voting reps, regardless of their length of service on the advisory committee, as well as to nominate other candidates. As proposed under the procedure in section 4.2, BV, although the advisory committee members would be permitted to nominate themselves, only members would be permitted to nominate other candidates. The commission finds that it is appropriate to allow the advisory committee members to nominate candidates in addition to themselves because the advisory committee members have the background based on their experience with the equity data plans to select nominees from the industry who have the knowledge that is essential to effectively serve on the operating committee. So basically, the SEC is allowing the advisory committee members to nominate themselves to serve as non-self-regulatory organization voting reps regardless of their length and service, and they're doing it because it would, it would uh, basically provide candidates who have direct experience with the operation of an NMS plan to be influencing the overall management of it. Okay, so the process for selecting non-SRO voting reps. This is the SRO, the self-regulatory organization's version of this proposal. So, Article 4, Section 4.2 BV proposes a procedure for nominating and electing non-SRO voting reps following their initial selection. Number one, pursuant to the proposal procedure, the operating committee must post a notice on its website seeking nominations from the public for an upcoming position at least two months prior to the expiration of a non-SRO voting rep's term. Members may submit individuals for consideration and non-SRO voting reps may nominate themselves if they have not already served their maximum term. Two. The non-SRO voting representatives will review the nominations and confirm by majority vote that a nominated individual meets the requirements for the category up for election at least one month prior to expiration of the term for the position, uh, position to be filled. Number three, within a week of the non-SRO voting reps confirmation of eligible nominees, the operating committee must post the list of nominees on its website and solicit comment from the public. Number four, the non-SRO voting reps will then consider and discuss the comments received and elect an individual by majority vote. And in the event that no nominee receives a majority vote, the individual with the more with more votes will in ultimately be the one uh, that wins. So number five, the non-SRO voting representative will repeat this process until an individual receives a majority vote. And a uh, number of votes will be eliminated from consideration and a new vote will be taken. Now this is the original proposal by the SROs, okay? 
Then we get the SEC modifications. So this is the SEC modifications to the process for selecting non-SRO voting reps. The commission is modifying Article 4, Section 4.2 BVA of the CT plan in three respects. First, the commission is modifying this section to provide that SRO voting reps, rather than members, will be permitted to submit names for consideration for open non-SRO voting representative positions. The commission finds that this modification is appropriate because while members of the CT plan are the SRO entities, the CT plan generally is organized such that it is the SRO voting reps that act on the behalf of the SROs in the operation of the CT plan. Second, the commission is modifying this provision to permit non-SRO voting reps to submit the names of individuals for consideration during the nomination process. The commission finds that this modification is appropriate because it permits the non-SRO voting reps to use the same process as SRO voting reps to nominate candidates for consideration to fill open non-SRO voting rep positions. Without this modification, non-SRO voting reps would need to use the public process to nominate candidates, while the SRO voting reps could directly nominate candidates. The commission does not believe that such asymmetrical treatment of members of the operating committee is justified, you dumb bitches. Third, the commission is modifying this provision to replace the language that permits non-SRO voting reps to nominate themselves if they have not served the maximum number of terms with the phrase, if they are not then competing or completing a second consecutive term. The commission finds that this modification is appropriate because non-SRO voting reps cannot serve more than two consecutive three-year terms and they therefore cannot nominate themselves to serve if they are completing a second consecutive term. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at the comments that were uh, filed after the SEC made the provisions to the plan. Basically, one commenter states that non-SRO voting rep seats should go to whoever can contribute positive innovations in market data infrastructure and questions whether allowing non-SRO voting reps to nominate themselves would further this end. The commission does not share this concern because it believes that non-SRO market participants from whom equity market data is a crucial aspect of business operations will have a strong interest in the prompt, accurate, reliable, and fair collection process distribu uh, distribution and publication of consolidated equity market data. Thus, the commission believes that it will be in the non-SRO voting representative's interest to select persons to serve on the operating committee who will further advance improvements and innovations in market data infrastructure. And the commission further believes that the public process for nominations and the turnover of non-SRO voting reps required by the term limits included in the CT plan will help ensure that no set of individuals becomes permanently entrenched as non-SRO voting reps by virtue of the ability to nominate themselves. Another commenter states that the ability of non-SRO voting reps to select themselves without SRO approval is inconsistent with the statutory authorization for the national market system under Section 11A and Rule 608. Look at these mofos bringing up rules again. You can't do it, Gary. We gotta follow the rules, Gary. You don't follow the rules, go F yourself. Anyways, so it's inconsistent with Section 11A, Rule 608, as the SROs are crying, as well as with the authority granted to SROs under Section 6 and 19 of the Act. As previously stated, you big bitch, the Commission believes that it has broad authority under Section 11A of the Act to grant non-SROs voting rights with regard to the governance of the CT plan. The Commission believes that the requirement that non-SRO members of the Operating Committee collectively select replacement non-SRO members will help ensure that the individuals selected will represent their constituents' views on important market data issues, and that the most effective and knowledgeable advocates for their views will serve on the Operating Committee. You stupid bitch. Okay, so we have Article 4, Section 4.2c, which describes SRO applicant observers. And this section of the CT plan provides that entities that have not yet been registered with the Commission as national securities exchanges may appoint an individual to attend regularly scheduled operating committee meetings or an SRO applicant observer if such an entity has submitted and the Commission has published a Form 1 to be registered as a National Securities Exchange or National Securities Association, or if such an entity is a National Securities Exchange that is not a member and the Commission has published the exchange's proposed rule change to operate a market. And by the way, the reason I'm not listing most of these super notes is because um, the majority of them are just references to IDs that you have to find in individual documents. So I'll have to look into all that later, but the filing does a good job of describing everything. So if there is a relevant super note that I see here, I will reference it below or I'll draw a little arrow to it. Anyways, the CT plan further provides that the, if the SRO applicants form one or proposed rule change is withdrawn, return or otherwise not actively pending before the commission, 
the SRO applicant will no longer be permitted to attend operating committee meetings. The commission finds that it finds that it is reasonable to allow an entity to attend meetings of the operating committee as a non-voting observer when it has filed a form one or proposed rule change to operate a market and the commission has published notice of, of that filing. The commission believes that attending meetings of the operating committee as an observer will allow an entity, uh, an equities market pending registration to be aware and familiarize itself with issues before the operating committee, before it becomes a national securities exchange or national securities association. They received no comments on this one, so it is approved. So basically what they're saying is that they want people that are becoming stock exchanges. Like this is amazing filing so far, by the way, everyone. Um, so far, so good. Uh, again, I am still skeptical because we're, you know, big filing and we're only a little bit of the way through, but so far, so good. Uh, basically what they're doing is uh, they, they want people that are becoming uh, exchanges or, you know, associations to sit in these meetings and get familiar with the, uh, with the operating committee's rules and the CT plan. That way they can follow the rules better when they become an exchange. So there, there you have it. Let's continue on. Okay, this is section four, <clears throat> prohibiting voting by non-operational equity trading venues. This was a huge one. The CT plan provides that in the event that a non-affiliated SRO or that all national securities exchanges in an SRO group cease operations as a market, those entities will not be permitted to appoint an SRO voting representative. Such a non-affiliated SRO or group will, however, be permitted to attend meetings of the operating committee as an observer, except for executive sessions. If such a non-affiliated SRO or SRO group does not commence operations within six months of attending the first operating committee as a non-operational exchange, it will no longer be permitted to attend the operating committee meetings until it resumes operations as a market. They did not receive any comments on this provision of the CT plan. The commission believes that this provision will help ensure that only those SROs that are contributing to the ge generation or collection of the core data disseminated by the plan will have a vote on the plan decisions. Accordingly, the commission is approving the provisions as proposed. Okay, so operating committee action and voting structure, allocation of votes to the SROs. So Article 4, Section 4.3 AI provides that each SRO voting rep will have one vote to cast on behalf of the SRO group or non-affiliated SRO that he or she represents with the second vote provided if the SRO group or non-affiliated SRO has a market center or centers that trade more than 15% of consolidated equity market share. This is humongous, okay? Because no market, no current exchange has more than 15% market share as per the filings we've seen come out this year. Now, what's also big about this is that right here, Super Note 310 says that the CT plan states that FINRA is not considered a market center. So hold on, if you wanna vote, you have to have a market center that gets 15% or market centers. What do we know about the market share right now? FINRA takes up most of it. If FINRA is no longer included in this, that volume's got to go somewhere else, likely on exchange, because they're incentivized now to have a 15% threshold of market share. That way they can have a vote and basically get decision-making capabilities about this plan. So that being said, the fact that FINRA is now cut out and market share is already fragmented, this will de-incentivize de dark pools to the extent that they're used today and re-incentivize a competitive market on the lit exchanges. Bye-bye ADF, you piece of shit. Now we're gonna look at operating committee actions and voting. So Article 4, Section 4.3b of the CT plan provides that with limited exceptions, action by the operating committee requires augmented majority vote, meaning a two thirds majority of all votes on the operating committee, provided that this vote also includes a majority of the SRO voting reps votes. And Article 4, Section 4.3c provides that the only operating committee actions that would not require an augmented majority vote or a vote that's two thirds majority of all votes on the operating committee are one, the selection of non SRO voting reps, two, the decision to enter into executive session, three, decisions concerning the operation of the com company as an LLC, four, modifications to the LLC related provisions of the agreement pursuant to Section 3.5 of the plan and five, the selection of officers of the company other than the chair pursuant to section 4.8. Super note 328 and 329 uh, takes you to an article of the plan and 328 provides that non-SRO voting reps will be selected by a majority vote of the then serving non-SRO voting reps. 329 says that 
providing that the decision to enter into executive session will be subject to a majority vote of the SRO voting reps. Operating committee actions and voting. Now we're going to look at the comments that were requested by the SEC. So the commission received comments on the aspect of the CT plan. One commenter expressly supports requiring an augmented majority vote that requires at least two thirds of the votes of the SRO voting reps and non-SRO voting reps and a majority of the SRO voting reps votes. Another commenter recommends that the commission amend the existing equity data plans to adopt augmented majority voting. One commenter states that the CD plan does not address instances where recusal of a non-SRO voting rep would result in the non-SRO having less than one third of the aggregate votes of the operating committee and strongly suggests that the CT plan be amended to provide that the votes of the non-SROs will always equal one third of the votes of the operating committee, even if one or more non-SRO representatives has re re, uh, recused. Another commenter expressed concern about the proposed argument majority voting scheme, particularly as it would be applied to operating committee actions, such as interpreting the CT plan's provisions. The commenter believes that the augmented voting requirement should apply to the SROs only to the extent needed to carry out their explicit regulatory obligations under the law, rather than to meet general responsibilities under the plan. One commenter state that the augmented majority vote will interfere with the SRO's ability to comply with the act. One commenter argues that the commission's mandate that votes be allocated by exchange group would prevent SROs from fulfilling their duty under the act to act jointly to implement the CT plan. This is because that voting structure could result in a situation where actions and plan amendments might be approved by the individuals representing non-SROs and a minority of the SROs, even if those actions or amendments were opposed by a majority of the SROs. Another commenter echoes this concern, stating, it is feasible that a minority of individual SROs would be able to adopt proposals over the objection of a majority of individual SROs. Under the proposed augmented majority voting scheme, and consequently, it would be possible for the non-SRO voting reps and a minority of non-affiliated SROs to force through plan actions and amendments without the assent of a majority of individual SROs. This commenter further states that allowing the CT plan operating committee to act with only the concurrence of a minority of the individual SROs would, would subvert the ability of the SROs to act jointly pursuant to section 11A. Whiners. So now let's take a look at the SEC response to the comments received. In response to those comments that the augmented majority vote could result in a scenario in which a proposal is adopted with the support of a supermajority of votes on the operating committee and a majority of votes allocated to the SROs, but without the support of a majority of the individual exchanges, the commission notes, as it did in the governance order, that this outcome is intended to be permissible. The commission believes that in order to break the voting monopoly currently held by the three SRO groups and give non-SROs a meaningful voice on the operating committee, Requiring that plan action be supported by a supermajority of the operating committee, which would include majority of the votes allocated to SROs along with sufficient non-SRO votes to achieve the supermajority, and that it not be constrained by votes of one or two SRO groups is appropriate. In response to comments that suggest modification to the voting allocation between SRO voting reps and non-SRO voting reps to account for recusal by non-SRO voting reps or a change in the number of SRO members, the commission does not believe it is necessary to modify the CT plan in that case. In the event a non-SRO voting rep must recuse itself pursuant to the terms of the plan, proposed Article 4, Section 4.4c provides that if a voting rep is recused, he or she will not count in the calculation to determine if there's a quorum necessary for the operating committee to vote. Now, the commenters that filed these, 342 is from SIBO, 344 is from Virtu. And that's typically the supernote structure in this filing. The comment supernotes tell you who the commenter is for the most part. Okay, so now let's look at meetings of the operating committee. Article 4, section 4.4 of the CD plan addresses meetings of the operating committee. And then we're going to look at section uh, 1 here, conduct of meetings and attendance. Section 4.4a provides that meetings of the operating committee may be attended by the voting reps, member observers, SRO applicant observers, SEC staff, and other persons as deemed appropriate by the operating committee. As proposed, member observers would be entitled to receive notice of all meetings of the company and to attend and participate in any discussion, but would not be entitled to vote on any matter. 
Now, as discussed above in Article 1, Section 1.1 of the CT Plan, the exchanges have proposed to define a new type of individual, a member observer, who may attend meetings of the CT Plan. As proposed, a member observer would be an individual other than a voting rep that a member, in its sole discretion, determines is necessary in connection with such member's compliance with its obligations under Rule 608C of Regulation NMS to attend the operating committee and subcommittee meetings. In the notice, the Commission solicited comments um, and views on whether an SRO would be reasonably find or would reasonably find it necessary to select a member observer to comply with its obligations under Rule 608C of Regulation NMS and under what circumstances, if any, the representation of an SRO on the operating committee by its selected SRO voting reps would be an insufficient means for the SRO to fulfill its obligations under Rule 608. The Commission also asked whether persons who, who hold certain positions with an SRO should be prohibited from serving as member observers, and whether, if member observers are necessary, only persons who perform certain roles within SRO should be able to serve as member observers. Lastly, the Commission solicited further comment on whether the CT plan should limit the number of member observers that each SRO would be permitted to name, or the frequency with which person or the frequency with which the person serving as a member observer can be changed. Okay, so here's the specific comments regarding the conduct of meetings and attendance. In response to the questions in the notice, the, co the commission received several comment letters regarding the proposed inclusion of member observers. Several commenters support including member observers in the CT plan. Those that support this are NASDAQ, Fidelity, ICI, and SIFMA. Specifically, one commenter supports including member observers to account for the practical uh, realities, realities involved with the day-to-day -day operation of and the SROs participation in the equity market data plans, which will be equally as relevant for the CT plan if it is approved. Now, some commenters state that it would be inappropriate to restrict the member observers to, to those who serve a particular role in the SRO. To limit the number of member observers that an SRO could name, or to limit the frequency with which such appointment of member observers could be changed. Now, the person that sent that was, looks like NASDAQ, FINRA, and ICI. Two commenters argue that such limitations would be arbitrary, as there is no way to predict when expert assistance may be necessary, and they further assert that such restrictions would not provide any benefit and would otherwise restrict the SRO's ability to make decisions about how to fulfill their regulatory responsibilities. That comment came from FINRA and NASDAQ. The commenter explains that member observers are necessary because the SRO voting reps collaborates with the others within their organization to make the best and most informed decisions. Acknowledging that, while the SRO voting reps may cast the votes, staff and senior management from various departments within the organization provide input into decisions made as needed. Okay, now we're gonna look at the con conduct of meetings and attendance. These are comments against member observers. So the commission also received several comment letters expressing concerns regarding member observers as proposed in the CT plan. One commenter states that without reasonable constraints, member observers may dilute the voice of non-SRO voting reps and enhance the SRO's ability to operate the CT plan in their own interests instead of co uh, consistent with the statutory purpose for which the plan exists. Now, who sent this comment? Looks like MFA. Now, also, and interesting, interesting, these, all, these parties also oppose this provision. BMO, ICI, SIFMA, MFA, BlackRock, Fidelity, RBC, Royal Bank of Canada, and Data Boiler. One commenter states that member observers should be limited so that an SRO cannot stack the deck with multiple member observers. This came from Data, data Boiler Letter 1. Another commenter expresses concern that if member observers participate in the operating committee meetings, it could uh, exacerbate or create conflicts of interest and place the non-SRO voting reps at a competitive disadvantage as they would not have similar ability to consult with outside persons who have expertise in the matter being discussed. That came from the Royal Bank of Canada. Several commenters state that non-SRO voting reps should be also permitted to invite observers to attend operating committees, executive sessions, and subcommittee meetings. That came from ICI, Schwab, BlackRock, Fidelity, and the Royal Bank of Canada. These commenters argue that better informed colleagues could advise non-SRO voting reps before, during, and after operating committee meetings, resulting in more informed discussions. Specifically, one commenter states that permitting non-SRO observers would provide for broader participation, improving transparency, 
and enhance the quality of guidance as well as assist in creating a pool of potential non-SRO voting reps. That came from BlackRock. One commenter recommends that the CT plan provide all voting reps with, with the ability to request an observer to participate in operating committee meetings so long as that voting rep specifies the purpose for their inclusion, including the relevancy to the topic under discussion and subject to the operating committee's approval. That came from the World Bank of Canada. Now let's take a look at the SEC response to the comments received on conduct of meetings and attendance. After careful consideration of the comments received, the Commission believes that this is appropriate for SROs to be permitted to designate member observers under the CT plan. The Commission agrees that there may be instances in which an SRO voting rep will require input from or benefit from collaborating with individuals with specialized views, experience with day-to-day -day operations, or expertise, including legal, regulatory, and technical knowledge, who are not designated as the SRO voting reps in order to facilitate an SRO's compliance with its regulatory obligations with respect to the CT plan. Specifically, the Commission is adding the following clause to the definition of member observer, which is provided that the designation of the member observer is consistent with the prohibition in section 4.10 BI. The Commission finds that this modification is appropriate to mitigate the effect of an SRO's conflict of interest on the operation of the CT plan specifically to the extent that a member offers proprietary market data products and it designates an employee that has a financial interest that is tied directly to the member's proprietary data business, that the individual has an inherent conflict of interest and cannot be designated as a member observer. Additionally, the commission is modifying the, this subsection to provide that a member observer may not attend or participate in operating committee meetings if their attendance or participation would be inconsistent with the conflicts of interest provisions requiring recusal. The Commission believes that a non-SRO voting rep may draw upon these provisions to seek approval of the operating committee to permit attendance by an informed colleague or other person at a CT plan meeting when the non-SRO voting rep believes that discussion of a matter may benefit from that person's additional expertise or input. For the reasons above, they are approving this section as modified. All right, now let's take a look at the chair of the operating committee. Article 4, section 4.4e provides for the selection of a chair of the operating committee. As proposed, a chair will be elected among the SRO voting reps to serve a one-year term beginning on the date of the first quarterly meeting of the operating committee following the operative date. An election to select the chair of the operating committee will be held every year. Pursuant to the CT plan to elect a chair, the operating committee will el elicit nominations for individuals to be considered for the chair position. If no candidate is elected by an augmented majority vote of the operating committee, the candidate with the lowest number of votes will be eliminated from the consideration and the operating committee will take another vote and repeat this process until a candidate is elected by an augmented majority vote of the operating committee. These provisions provide for a nomination selection process that allows input from all members of the operating committee. The commission further believes that a one-year term will allow frequent rotation of the duties and responsibilities that are associated with the chair position. They received no comments and are approving this, uh, this section as proposed.